All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, and thanks so much for being here. You know, that video was really, I don't know about you, but that video was really moving. It, um, it's really a powerful reminder that the issue that we're talking about today and tomorrow, of financial predation, doesn't just have a financial cost. It's not just a financial issue. It affects health, family bonds, and overall well-being. It affects everybody. So I'd like to take a moment also to uh, acknowledge and thank Philip Marshall for attending this conference. But more importantly, for your courage, uh, for your courage, your example, and your continued work, your continued advocacy. The fact that this case was so high profile helped turn the attention to the growing problem of financial exploitation of older Americans. And your sustained work and others has helped to keep it focused. So I hope today and tomorrow uh, we'll keep that focus on th this conversation, not just in the next two days, but going forward, and that more people learn about this and get involved. So thank you. So before I add my thoughts, my remarks, I too have to issue the classic Fed disclaimer. Uh, the remarks I make today are mine alone and do not reflect anyone else in the Federal Reserve System or in the Federal Open Market Committee. There. OK, I can't get in trouble with my bosses. Well, the question of protecting older citizens is always important. It is in taking on an increasingly important role, and because of the wide-ranging implications it has, owing to really just a simple math of demographics. With the boomers, we will see the largest generation in history ushered into retirement and older age, not to mention that they are living longer than any generation before them. Now, as a boomer myself, I think that's a good thing. Let me make that very clear. But from a regulatory and an economic perspective, it is something that absolutely deserves full attention. This conference will cover some of the key problems and conundrums of the often murky subject of financial safety for our aging population. I don't expect that we'll manage to solve each of them in the space of two days. Though I hope, but I hope so, and hope springs eternal. But I do think that this is a platform to discuss them frankly and to address these issues head on. The first is to outline the scope of the issue, or in some cases, the lack of scope. While there has been some excellent research, we don't yet have a firm data on how large this issue actually is. Estimates of the annual cost of exploitation alone range from just under $3 billion to over $36 billion. And that is not necessarily taking into account the wider issue, the wider range of fraud. There's also the matter of how and when victimization may be exacerbated. While the extended golden years are in and of themselves a good thing, they are often accompanied by flagging physical and cognitive health, each of which can affect both access and attention to finances leaving people more vulnerable. Add whatever unknown unknowns are out there to the known unknowns, and we are in brand new territory. Without a greater understanding of the size and scope, we're limited both in combating the problem and knowing how effective our efforts are. Like virtually every issue of import, this is not a problem that stands in isolation. It is woven into other segments of the economy, healthcare, for instance, or student debt. As an example, the CFPB has reported that in the decade before 2015, the number of adults over 60 taking on student loans fully quadrupled, with roughly three quarters assumed on behalf of children and grandchildren. Not only does that have the potential to spill over to the real economy, it's poised to become a multi-generational problem. I should also note the obvious, that more people, are living, more people living longer means more people entering retirement with plans that may have estimated a shorter life expectancy on fixed incomes that could be further compromised by the health issues that become more common as we age. That could add to debt and in turn to the possibility of default. Research from our colleagues at the New York Fed shows that debt held by people between 50 and 80 
increased some 60 percent from 2003 to 2015. Now, while each of these factors, student debt, retirement costs, elder care, might not be crisis-inducing in and of itself, the interconnectivity could make the sum more systemically dangerous than the individual parts. It may be that the problem of elder financial exploitation is not fully contained, but it could spill over into the larger economy. The sheer size, the sheer size and complexity pose a challenge for industry and regulators alike. Now look, I don't mean to sound alarmist, but this is a set of, set of circumstances ripe to balloon. But that doesn't mean it has yet. And the best guard against a future crisis is building a bulwark in the present. That brings me to the second issue, financial institutions' concerns about the conundrums posed by current laws and regulations. While institutions want to help protect their customers, especially vulnerable seniors, they're worried about the legal consequences of putting holds on suspicious electronic transfers and deposits because they are legally bound to expedite the process. They're also reluctant to share information about potentially suspicious act account activity with other institutions for fear of violating federal and state privacy laws. That's particularly unfortunate because we have evidence that sharing information could be a huge help. Larry, Larry Santucci just published a paper that looks at how data sharing among financial institutions could improve the financial health of older Americans, specifically those with cognitive difficulties. Now, Larry will be discussing this tomorrow, so I urge you to stick around for day two. So, there, Larry, I put the plug in for you. <laughs> now, there will be some relief from these regulatory concerns when the FINRA rule changes come into effect next February. Brokerages will be allowed to place temporary holds on disbursements of funds or securities when they have reasonable belief that certain customers may be victims of financial exploitation. Additionally, new rules will require those institutions to make an effort to obtain names and information for trusted contacts on such customers' accounts. But I understand that there is still more, much more that needs to be done. Now that leads me to the third issue that should be addressed today, which is banks' engagement and responsibility on both an individual and an industry level. Like much other information, we are in the Wild West territory regarding exactly who's pursuing solutions. And while I know data isn't the plural of anecdote, I am concerned that some of my research staff estimates a relatively low number of institutions actively looking for and implementing safeguards. Again, there has been some regulatory constraint and I understand the predicament, but I know it can be done because there's already some very good work being done by individual banks, some of whom we'll hear from during the course of this conference. The more we discuss these kind of issues in these kind of venues, the more we can learn about best practices. And I hope you can take some of that away from this conference. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to address this issue, these problems early on. So industry can inform regulation as it develops. The interest of regulator and institution is the same here, protecting the customer. From our perspective, it's the sine qua non of regulation. From the industries, it is an essential business component because it is fundamental to trust. The entire financial system and each of its constituent parts is dependent on consumer trust to function correctly. Getting out in front of an issue, particularly one this particularly significant, is good for everyone. Now, as a Fed president, I draft neither regulation nor legislation. So you're probably sitting there thinking it's easy for me to make the call when you're not on the field. And I'm not telling anyone how to run their own organization but I would urge everyone to study the issue and embed solutions. Share your ideas so we can learn from one another. Make working on those ideas a business priority. 
And finally, work together. Whether it's a task force or a set of industry standards, finding a way to guide the solution in real time, instead of waiting for reactive regulation, is in the financial service industry's best interest, as well as the consumers. In the words of an old proverb, if we don't change our direction, we're likely to end up where we're headed. With that, I've done, I think, enough pontificating, and I'll relinquish the floor. But before I go, I want to say that I truly value the industry insight and the work done by our regulatory colleagues. So thank you. Thank all of you for coming today and for your input. I also want to thank the team here, uh, here at the Fed, along with Jason uh, Kolowish and his team at Penn Medicine for bringing together such an incredible group of panelists uh, at this conference. And to everyone who's taken the time and the effort to present here. This discussion is important, and it's too important to let it go quiet. So thank you for participating. Have a good day. Thanks. <laughs>